All right, we're speaking about the secret aims of globalization. What are the real purposes in globalization? And as we do, as we study God's Word, to understand more about globalization, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me in prayer as we open our time together. Father in heaven, thank you for the Bible that gives us very relevant understanding of our times based on the experience of those before. And we pray that you will show us through your Holy Spirit how to understand what we must be in order to navigate the difficult and unique circumstances ahead of us. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been studying the rise of uh, the New World Order and globalization. And what we have learned so far is that the globalists love cities because the cities can control the masses. Secondly, we learned that they love a common language because without a common language, they can't move along very quickly. But with a common language, they can progress very rapidly into the future. Thirdly, they're obsessed with security. Um, globalists are concerned about all manner of security, whether it's national security or personal security or, or security of uh, data or, uh, well, all manner of security. Also, globalists love war. Chaos provides an opportunity that they can control more and increase their, uh, their control over the world. Number six, they, can, they love to control education because they can then manipulate the minds of children as the next generation of leaders. And number seven, they love to control food resources. And uh, we have some uh, businesses today that are doing a lot to globalize uh, food control. But today we're going to study how God used His servants in the midst of globalization to reveal His glory. This is a very important principle. Um, <clears throat> in the New World Order, there is always a crisis. It seems that crises are everywhere. One crisis follows another. And there's sometimes many crises all at once. But when there is a crisis um, for God's people, God is always prepared with a solution. In fact, that crisis is used by God to reveal himself. But God always has a counterattack for every crisis of God's people and God's church. Why does God um, have a counter, uh, a counteraction to the crisis? Well, first of all, it's because he wants to prevent destruction of his church. And he sends voices of reproof and warning so that they might heed those, those uh, warnings and reproofs. And then God will protect them from uh, an existential crisis. Secondly, God wants to use the crisis to enlighten the wicked, even the leaders of wicked nations. And uh, Babylon is no exception, of course. God always has his witnesses. That's number three. God always has his witnesses. In every crisis, in every global crisis, in every national crisis, there will always be some who will give a true picture of the true God. Number four, there is always a prophetic voice in every crisis. And uh, the end times is no exception. Um, a prophet arises to address the emergency. And emergencies arise, of course, from Satan's malice toward Christ. And the more Satan hates Christ, of course he does with ultimate passion, then there's going to be plenty of crises for God's people because Satan is working to destroy them. He is the enemy. So, why were the reasons that God needed a prophet in Babylon? 
Daniel chapter 2 is about the rise of the prophetic voice in the new world order in the midst of globalization and God needs a prophetic voice in globalization but why well there's a number of reasons number one God uses or used Babylon to punish Israel but Babylon needed enlightenment and so God's intention was to use the punishment of Israel to enlighten this wicked city of Babylon and Babylon was wicked God never punishes the wicked without light and warning that's the second reason why God needed a prophet in Babylon because God needed to warn them so that they would not that they could choose to heed the light and avoid the punishment number three this is the most amazing part perhaps Babylon's prophet was speaking to us in the last days um, Babylon had its prophet in Daniel but that prophet was also talking about our own times he was telling us about what was going to happen in the last days and it's very important that we accept that the Bible is a prophetic book for us in our times as well and not only that because we are also called to be the prophetic voice if we understand the prophecies of scripture then we become God's voice in warning to the globalized world in our times next is um, that God established the prophetic anchor God needed to establish a prophetic anchor that we can then use now to understand that prophecy comes to pass and that all of the Bible prophecies are valid and relevant and will in fact happen God established an anchor especially in Daniel chapter 2 that we can verify history after the fact and thereby anchor our faith in the prophecies of the Word of God We need to have confidence that God has everything under control. And it's very important that we understand this because Daniel chapter 2 gives us the sense that God is in control of everything. One nation right after another, exactly as God said would happen. These things give us confidence in the Bible. These things give us, it's prophecy that gives us confidence in God and makes it relevant to our times. So, Daniel and his friends were ten times wiser than all the Chaldeans themselves. All the astrologers, all the magicians, all those that were part of the realm of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel exceeded them all by ten times and was wiser and more understanding and had better discernment than all of them combined. This was the foundation for the prophetic voice in the globalized world okay the fact that Daniel was so much wiser so much more divinely inspired that this became the foundation so that God could then use Daniel as the prophetic voice in Babylon now Nebuchadnezzar thought that Daniel was good really good but he didn't realize anywhere near how good Daniel really was especially for his kingdom and that's important because um, Nebuchadnezzar underestimated Daniel he thought that he was the final authority in fact all globalists think that a human or a human agency is somehow the final authority whether it's the Supreme Court or the or uh, some other uh, entity some legal entity but friends God is the final authority and Daniel was in, was appointed to show Nebuchadnezzar that God is the last word um, God sets up kingdoms and governments and God takes them down and God needed to make this plain to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant he thought he was he was it his kingdom was gonna last forever but God was to show him that this was a false understanding of his own kingdom Daniel was to be the one to whom Nebuchadnezzar would go for advice 
And God will use his people in the last days to do the same thing. He will use them to bring advice to the leaders of the world or to others to help them find their way, not only to navigate the circumstances of their times, but also to find their way to the kingdom of heaven. So God needed a prophet to speak for him, and God chose Daniel. Daniel was now in position um, with the end of chapter 1 because he was now recognized as wiser and more intelligent than all the rest. He was now in position. So let's come to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. That means that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't sleep at night after he saw this dream, but strangely, he couldn't remember the dream. So, he had to do something about it. Verse 2, Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now you can imagine that early in the morning the king sent out a summons to all his close counselors. You know, he sent messengers to all their homes early in the morning. The city was still basically asleep. So why would he need such an urgent meeting so early in the morning? What's this all about? Well, they show up in the king's palace and Nebuchadnezzar explains the problem to them. Verse 3. The king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Well, that's fair enough. The Chaldeans decided they better ask what the dream was, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do their thing. So they said in verse 4, they spake, Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Thy servant, uh, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Well, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream. And um, he begins to suspicion these, these men. Uh, the dream was so troubling that he demands that they tell him. If you can't tell me the dream, you're worthless, basically is what he said to them. Verse um, <clears throat> 5 says, The king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. He threatened them. Well, they make a second request. They thought maybe he'd be a little more reasonable, you know. Um, then he said, oh, furthermore, in verse 6, he said, If you show me the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. You see, Nebuchadnezzar knew that if they couldn't show him the dream, if they couldn't tell him what his dream was, then he couldn't really trust their interpretation. They would make up something, perhaps. But verse 7, they answered again, they made a second request. They said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. Well, the king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed until I forget about it all. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can show me the interpretation. Now, these poor men were in a difficult spot. And the king distrusts these Chaldeans, and he's angry at them. He's very rash in his demand that they tell him the dream, otherwise he would kill them. And this, this rash anger God permitted so that uh, the Chaldeans would make an astonishing statement, an astonishing admission. Listen to this. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Oh, yes, there was. 
but they didn't know him. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. This has never been done before. Well, God specializes in doing things that have never been done before. And that's the amazing thing about what God does to his people. And he will do this in the last days just like he's done it in the past. This is a prophetic story for us that we may understand our times and we may live and act in the way that Daniel lived and acted and that God can use us in the way that he used Daniel and his friends. It is a rare thing, verse 11, that the king requireth and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. What an admission. God was going to show that he does dwell with flesh. Those who are contrite in heart, those who are humble, those who are willing to live by God's principles. And so Daniel was to be the chosen one to bring the message to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's temper was enraged even more. Verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Friends, this was Satan's attempt to destroy God's prophet in Babylon. Satan tried to destroy Daniel and his three friends right when they were about to be given the greatest position and have the greatest credibility in all of their lives. Yet God allowed this to happen so that Daniel would be brought to prominence. Satan was working against God, but God has a counterattack. You can see it in the story of Daniel. But why wasn't Daniel among the Chaldeans? This is an important question. Why wasn't Daniel invited to be there with those Chaldeans? Well, number one, they perhaps thought he was too young. You know, this was something that needed the experience of many years. And therefore, he was too inexperienced. Daniel, being too inexperienced, they thought, well, maybe it'd be better that he doesn't come. It's, not a, it's, it's, it's too important of a problem um, for someone of lesser experience. By the way, they thought it was also too important of a problem for someone who was a foreigner. After all, this was a Babylonian thing, and this was something that the Babylonians needed to solve. You see, globalists don't normally turn to God for answers. They ignore Christians and God's people when making New World Order decisions. In fact, they view them as a nuisance and is irrelevant. They only collaborate, if necessary, under political necessity. So they work for expedience. They don't, they don't want to, to consult anyone but their own wisdom. So Daniel was absent. And this is the same kind of thing that happens today. You know, globalists don't come to God's people and say, what should we do? You know, they do what they think is best. So Daniel <clears throat> was sought by Arioch, the captain of the king's guard. Notice verse 14. Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. All right, so Daniel and Arioch were probably friends by now. Um, he knew Daniel quite well by this time. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. He didn't just rashly react. He thought, you know, I ought to ask for time. So he asked for an audience with Nebuchadnezzar, and it was granted. And he went in and asked for time. It says in verse 16, um, Daniel then went in and desired of the king that he should give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Oh, 
Nebuchadnezzar thought, well, this is good. Somebody at least might be willing to show me the interpretation. Sure, you can have some time. You know, this was such a, a poignant issue. It was so big. It was so important that if somebody would provide some hope, that there would be an answer, a solution, and Nebuchadnezzar would give them whatever they wanted. So Daniel was given time. And notice what happened next. It says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Now I want you to notice that Daniel uses their Hebrew names, not their Babylonian names, because these men are companions with him in the service of God. They're not companions in the service of Babylon in that sense. They were now going to plead with God. So uh, Daniel uses their Hebrew names so that they would join him in this prayer season. That they would, verse 18, desire mercies of God, of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So they had a prayer meeting. And I think it's important to understand what kind of prayer meeting this was. First of all, it was a fervent prayer meeting. They were earnest in their pleas to the God of heaven that God would show them what the king's dream had been. They desired the mercies of God. And by the way, this was the mercy of God on Daniel and his friends and for that matter on all the Chaldeans when God gave Daniel the dream. Um, this was a life and death matter and Daniel no doubt told God that his time had come and he'd better work now otherwise it would all be ended and so God um, uh, heard Daniel's prayer but they, th they, they, they expressed their confidence in God um, um, that God would show them the, the dream they threw themselves on the mercy of God and then they went to bed. They went to sleep. They went to a peaceful sleep trusting in the almighty God to reveal uh, above, uh, re reveal to them what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. God is almighty. God is above it all. God does oversee it all and we can see this being played out in this story. Daniel receives the dream. Notice verse, 19, uh, verse 18. No, verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Notice that Daniel first thanked God. Before rushing off to see Nebuchadnezzar, he thanked God first and foremost. <clears throat> he, said, he answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons, and removeth kings, and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Oh, friends, I don't know about you, but in the last days, um, God's people will have a similar experience with the... Uh, with the people of this world in the new globalization. So he goes to Arioch. Daniel goes to Arioch and um, uh, in verse 24, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show unto the king the interpretation. And of course Arioch brings him in and now um, uh, Arioch points out some things to the king. Notice that it says that Arioch, verse 25, brought in Daniel before the king in haste. I like that, in haste. <laughs> um, Arioch wanted to impress the king that he had found someone. Not that he had found him, but that's what he wanted it, the king to believe. He says, I have found a man of the captives of Judah. He wanted to point out that Daniel was a slave, actually. And this slave was going to reveal the interpretation of the dream. Not only the dream, but also the interpretation, I should say. 
Um, Daniel answered, and well, um, let's see, verse 26. The king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. He points out that the king's closest advisors who should have been able to not only interpret the dream but to reveal the secret... They had failed. And he points out that, that they had, he, he makes a point of this, that they had failed. <laughs> and then he comes to the king and he says, but there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions in thy head upon thy bed are these. So Daniel points out that the wise men of Babylon and specifically named them, but that they could not tell the dream, but that there is a God. He gives the glory to God as he makes the thing known to Nebuchadnezzar. So I want you to notice that he also said that he's making the king, uh, making the things known upon the, uh, in the king's mind uh, in the dream that he had, what will happen in the latter days in verse 28. He says, uh, the God of heaven revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king what shall be in the latter days. That's talking about our time as well. Because the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had goes from Nebuchadnezzar's time right down through the ages, right down to the very end of time. So what's important is not so much what happens from Nebuchadnezzar right on down to the feet of the great image. What's important is what happens at the end of time, which perhaps is out there in the, the tips of the toes. Anyway, the king is absolutely gobsmacked. He just can't imagine that somebody would be so accurate in revealing the dream. But this gives him enormous credibility in Daniel. And he recognizes the dream and he acknowledges it before Daniel. And we read about that in verse 20. Mm. That would be 36. This is the dream, and we, tell the, we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, and so on. And um, verse, we come down, and the whole story is, is revealed there. But then in verse 46 it says, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshipped Daniel. Imagine that. The king worshipping a slave. And commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors for him. A ritual, so to speak, to recognize Daniel as the one who had uh, divine insight into the dream. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel great, a great man, and gave him many gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. He became essentially the prime minister. Daniel was promoted. Daniel, um, however, did not neglect his friends. <laughs> Daniel, by the way, wasn't impressed with all these honors and, and um, f you know, recognition and gifts. He, it, it, these things didn't interest him. Daniel was interested in the credibility of God. Now Daniel, however, was the most credible person in the nation, the whole kingdom. And um, he was promoted now to prime minister. But Daniel did not neglect his friends. Notice this. Verse 49. It says that Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So, in other words, Daniel was honored as the top ruler 
of the land under the king. But Daniel's friends became the rulers of the province of Babylon. The king gave Daniel what he requested. But in the last days, God will also have a prophetic voice in the midst of globalization. If you look at Daniel chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 13, it says, But th go, thy way, go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot in the end of the days. In other words, Daniel was going to die. Daniel was going to sleep in the grave. But there would arise in the last days a voice, a prophetic voice in the midst of the final globalization. Daniel is to stand in his lot at the end of days. And who is that prophetic voice today? Friends, it is those who understand and reveal the message of the book of Daniel and also the book of Revelation and all the message of righteousness by faith in the last days, including the the principles of the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, the state of the dead, those things which are prophetic <clears throat> principles, God's people in the last days will reveal them once again. Why is the prophetic voice important? Well, it awakens confidence in God. God needs a prophetic voice to reveal himself to the world around us. And in the last days, it's especially important because it points the way through the crisis. And God needs people. God needs men, men and women, who will reveal the truth of God from the Scriptures, but also point the way through the crisis. So let's summarize, again, the objectives of the New World Order and then look at God's response. First of all, the New World Order wants to use cities to control the masses. Secondly, they want a common language to also accelerate their progress. They're obsessed with security. That's number three. Number four, they're concerned about climate change. Number five, they love war and chaos, which provides them opportunities to control even further. They want to control the education. They want to control the food resources. And they don't want restraints. We learn that in the story of Daniel. They don't want restraints. But God has his own response. In Revelation 14, verse 6. Let us read Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It is a global message for a globalized world. You see, the angel stands up against globalization. The angel of Revelation 14, verse 6. That angel stands up by giving and proclaiming the first angel's message here in Revelation 14. There's three angels here. And it gives the first message and it's especially a message against globalization because the gospel has to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And of course, globalization involves um, also the control of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Let's read that in Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So you have the type and the anti, or rather the, uh, yeah, the, the type and the anti-type. You have the, um, the uh, opposition to God, and you have the antidote uh, to the globalization of the last days. Both of them are global in principle. Um, secondly, the, uh, God's response involves the, the rise of the prophetic voice. God's people will become more and more prominent and the prophetic principles that they have will become increasingly um, significant and noticed by others. Um, so there's a connection between the last remnant people and Daniel the prophet. They become the 
prophetic voice in the final globalization. Number three, they bring truth to benighted leaders. Those leaders who are, um, who, who are unaware of the principles of truth and righteousness will receive or will be given the message so that they will be able to make a decision just like everyone else. God has to reach not only the, the common people, the poor people, He has to reach the leaders, the rulers, and the wealthy. He has to reach them all. He has to bring these benighted people to the point of a decision. And so God needs a prophetic voice in the last days to do that. And lastly, God will pour out His latter rain upon His people. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Some will accept the truth. Others will deny it and will turn from it. But God intends to use the prophetic voice to, um, to effectively, through the power of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, to give the last warning message, especially the warning message of the third angel and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, which is to come out of Babylon and have nothing to do with this false system of God of uh, worship that's, um, that's strengthened and, and uh, promoted by globalization. So friends, here we are. We're living in the last days. And God wants us to understand that the time has come for the prophetic voice once again. So may God bless us and help us to find and understand and have wisdom and knowledge of the Bible and live by the principles of Christ and of heaven so that we may also present that final prophetic message for the last days in the midst of the final globalization. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the Bible that reveals through the story of Daniel the very principles that we need to understand for our own times. And I pray that you will give us your wisdom and understanding. May we have a special understanding of the prophetic principles of our times. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.